Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Sad Times. That was the most normal way I've said that in a long time. My name is Kevin. I am the host of Sad Times. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've never been here before, welcome. Here is a quick primer. At Sad Times, each week we have a guest on uh, who tells stories, uh, whether it be about times that they went through traumatic events, uh, strong, uh, they felt strength in areas of their life that they didn't even know, and they were able to overcome very insurmountable odds, times when they were upset, angry, uh, frustrated, so on and so forth, because we do believe at sad times that stories that are difficult are universal, but they're not universally told. So that is our hope here. Our goal is not to judge or diagnose or solve the problems uh, of the stories that our guests share, but simply to have these stories told so that others can hear it and maybe feel less alone or maybe feel a little more empathy for the world. So that's what sad times is. In a moment, we will get to our guests. We do have a website, which is www.sadtimespodcast.com. You go there, you can register to be a guest. We can let you know how it works. All of our episodes are there. You can give them a listen. So please check it out or find Sad Times wherever podcasts magically appear on your device. Well, we have to pay the bills. And so in order to pay the bills, we have signed up a sponsor. Uh, Brent and I found this after many, many meetings um, so Sad Times is brought to you by the single high-pitched guitar note that is played when Dateline returns from one of its 38 commercial breaks. Ever wonder if the entire human condition can be expressed in a single guitar note? Wonder no more. Trauma, exuberance, the deep and pulsing meaning of life, all the pathos of the human condition plucked for you and for me. That's the single high-pitched guitar note that is played when Dateline returns from one of its 38 commercial breaks. Dateline is life, and the rest is just details. Brent, thank you for securing that uh, sponsor. All right, the bills are paid. Let's get to why we're here, uh, which is, got, this is an incredible story, and I can't wait to share it with everybody. And I am here with Masuda. Hey, Masuda, how are you doing? Good morning, Kevin. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for asking me and yourself. Oh, I'm hanging in there. Thank you. And where are you talking to us from? Uh, I'm talking to you from beautiful San Diego, California. Well, lucky you. Uh, that's better than where I am, which is just outside of Chicago. Although it's not too bad today. How's the weather there? Let me guess. Is it 70 and sunny? No, actually, oh. it's the opposite. It's been raining. Oh, yes, no. It's kind of... Uh, cold and uh gloomy but um it's okay it's just part of life that's true that's true and you know masuda we spoke um not too long ago a couple days ago and uh, let's just get right to it your story is something that moved and inspired me and i've been kind of talking to brent and a couple other people brent the producer about what an amazing story this is so let's start with where you're from where are you originally from masuda well, Kevin, thank you so much for um, recognizing the power of my story. I'm very humbled and grateful for it. Uh, I was born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan, until about the age of 11. And what happened when you were 11? When I was 11 years old, um, Afghanistan, unfortunately, uh, was invaded in 1979 by the Russians. Mm. So uh, my father's life was in danger. I already lost an uncle who was a pharmacist and my other uh, uncle was a doctor. They were going to kill him. They were basically going after the elites, the educated, the businessmen, the successful people. And my father was drafted to the army once and then twice his best friend was killed so that's when he decided that he was going to leave the country wow and he was supposed to uh leave by himself because uh, he had hired he was going to hire a smug smuggler to get him out since i don't have a brother my father was courageous to make an incredible decision that was really risky to take his six children all girls and his wife, he said to my mother and us, we're either going to live together or die together. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we couldn't tell anybody. We could not say goodbye to my best friends or relatives. The only people that 
that in my family knew about our escape was my grandparents on my father's side. So um, it was a very, very dramatic experience for me because I had to say goodbye to my beloved daughter. It was a she, and she was my best friend. And until this moment that I'm telling you, my heart is burning with pain. Yes, because, okay, so you're 11 years old, you're one of six, you have to leave in the middle of the night. Only your father's parents know about it, and you have to say goodbye to your dog, who, how, how long have you had that dog? Oh, uh, since I was a kid, probably like, uh, maybe since I was five, six years old. Wow. That had to be so horrible. For a long time in my short years. And it was horrible. I was very close to Jake. And um, I was her caregiver. And I kissed her every morning before dad would take me to school. And first thing I did, I hugged Jake when I came home after school. And um, I just, I'm getting choked up right now. Sorry. That's Okay. I mean, that is an extremely, extremely difficult thing to have to deal with. I mean, we, we well, speaking for myself, I think uh, we, we have such strong connections with our pets. I even have strong connections with uh, Brent's dogs because I, I see them so much. So to have to say goodbye to our constant companions in any form is horrible. But to do it in the dead of night with your possible life being on the line is a whole other thing. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, I have not been able to adopt another dog. I'm a cat person now. Oh, We've okay. had six cats, and uh, I will never be. I will never replace Jake. And there have been opportunities where I wanted to, but uh, she's got a special place in my heart, and so we're physically have been separated for over four decades but spiritually she's with me that's beautiful um so once you did have to make that horrible break and leave what what happened next so we went to pakistan because that's our neighboring country and most people that left afghanistan and we were not alone just so you know a lot of people are getting out of afghanistan in the 80s because of war. And unfortunately, war has a horrific impact on people's livelihoods. Nobody, I did not wanna leave my country. I didn't understand the complexities of war and what was happening politically, because I was only 11 years old. But all I knew is that I couldn't tell my, I couldn't say goodbye to my friends, my little bestie in school or, you know, it was just horrific. So we went to Pakistan. And mind you, I am the second daughter out of six daughters, and I was only 11 when we left. So the rest of my siblings were very young, and we had a very slim chance of surviving this escape because not only we had to worry about being caught by the, by the um, Russians, by the government people, and also by the warlords at the time, they were called Mujahideens. They were kind of like a friendlier version of the Taliban's. Mm -hmm. And we were all cramped up in a station wagon. Could not. We didn't really bring anything other than some dry goods so that we can survive this um, a week uh, escape. It was hor hor horrible, and we had uh, different check points that our smuggler had to stop and at one point they took my father out of the car the mujahideen okay and we had to spend the night uh overnight and we thought oh my gosh because he had some fake paperwork that he was coming to united states to study medicine and when they saw the paperwork they said oh no we need you to stay and study medicine here we need doctors so kind of the, the opposite of what we had hoped for. And we thought that we were going to lose our father. I mean, my mother, we all started praying in this little station wagon that we were all um, in. So uh, luckily, 
I don't know what happened because I was only 11, but I think we paid him off. And the next morning, uh, we were let go. Okay. God, that had to be harrowing. It was horrific to see our father out of all the people uh, get picked and went outside. And, you know, they were out there talking for a long time. And then basically we just couldn't continue with our uh, drive. We had to spend the night in these little huts that we stayed at over time, you know, where we had to be very quiet because, you know, the helicopters were flying over or it was just out of a movie, literally out of a movie, nerve wracking. I mean, so much anxiety for me uh, as a little 11 year old, but I was very, very devastated that I was driving away from my dog that I was never going to see Jake again. And so uh, to make long story short, it took us that a week, and then our car broke down. <laughs> oh man! I had to get out. Everybody had to get out and push the station wagon. Oh. Uh, it just—I will never forget that part of my life. And very, and very- how long were you traveling um, from when you left Afghanistan into Pakistan? To when then you find when you and your family finally did make your way to the United States. How long did that? Was that total time period? Long two years. Wow! So it took us a week. The, the trip from Afghanistan to Pakistan is not that long, maybe sure. a day or two days. But because of the danger of the situation, uh, we could not really drive during the day, so we had to hide and drive in the night time. Um, once we got to uh, Pakistan, we ended up uh, in the capital of Islamabad. Okay. Because it's really nice, and we stayed there. We, I have, I had two uncles, one in the United States in Hollywood, California, and the other one in uh, Germany. So they both wanted to sponsor us to come and be with them. We ended up coming to America, thank God, because my uncle was the only one here. The other uncle had, you know, uh, relatives in Germany, and uh, even back then in the eighties, uh, it was a really, really nerve-wracking process to get uh, sponsored some families would be there for two three years and then they wouldn't pass the interview so and did they have to interview all eight of you like my father my mother and the older sisters got it okay that is nerve-wracking and you said it took so that interview does that happen towards the end of that two years it's kind of the last hurdle that you have to get over in order to get to america am i understanding that Okay. Yes, Kevin. Yes. Okay. So you're 13. You get to Hollywood. Um, tell us what where your mind's at. You've just had, uh, shall we say, an extremely traumatic two years. Uh, tell us where you're, and you're you're outside of your home. How 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 are you feeling? What are you thinking? Absolutely, Kevin. Before I answer that question, I just want to mention that. Um, and there's a reason why I'm mentioning what I'm going to mention is that in Pakistan, uh, mm. we were not welcomed. As you know, nobody likes refugees. Let's face it. They're over here, taking over our country, blah, blah, blah. And um, the kids wouldn't play with me. And uh, I felt really, really not only that I'd missed my best friends in school and my life, beautiful life in Afghanistan. I felt really alone, very alone. Uh, very lonely. And when we came to America, it was a culture shock, Kevin, because uh, we lived in Kabul, very, very private life, very peaceful life, very small, different culture, different language. I mean, it's like uh, black and white, the difference in my life in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and then all of a sudden to the most powerful country in the world. And I got off, when we got off the plane, I was just like shocked getting from LAX to my uncle who lived in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the, how the the cars were going at the speed of light. I had never seen highways in my life. And these cars were just zooming like 90 uh, 90 miles per hour. And um, it was just unfathomable for me as a 13 year old i was scared i was here we go again and um did you speak any english at all none 
None. Wow. And I, I, I want to make a point, Masuda. You make a very good point, a point to point out. Let me say point again, uh, to point out what you say about refugees. And I think it's something that we're going to further discuss here in the, in the coming uh, moments. Uh, but it's a very good point to make that, unfortunately, refugees who are put in the most impossible positions are often it's very difficult to, to find a welcoming uh, country or situation. And so it's not that it, it's just so powerful your that's what one of the things that makes what your family did so powerful that they were able to uh endure over these two years and then get to to the u.s and in hollywood um the culture shock had to be as you said uh, black and white night and day and you don't even speak the language how so t- what was your mental health like at this time before i answer that question i want to mention one important thing kevin Mm-hmm. My father, refugees are successful, educated people in their own countries. My family, my grandfather was one of the palm pioneers of uh, handmade rugs, the designer that started that business. So my fa- my family was, uh, you know, very comfortable in Afghanistan, to put it in a humble way. And some of our cl- their clients were Americans, because as you know, well, I don't know if you know, but in the 60s and 70s, Afghanistan was one of the most desirable, uh, exotic places in Asia for um, Europeans and Americans. I did not know they, that. Okay. They call it the Switzerland of Asia because it is absolutely stunning. The mountains, the rivers, the lakes, it is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. You, Somebody is kind of reminding me of that. But I wanted to bring this up. The reason why we were um, accepted to United States of America is because of my father's close uh, interactions with American uh, buyers. So, and my dad, my father spoke English, obviously different English. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the person who had interviewed him was very impressed the fact that my father had uh, business. Uh, interactions with America. So that's one of the reasons why I believe that uh, we got the green light to come to the United States of America. Thank God. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and that is, so you, you do get the, the green light and it, it, so you you arrive. How, tell us how you started to adjust. What was school like? Just so you know, uh, my last grade that I had completed uh, was fourth grade. Okay. So I didn't go to school for two years uh, in uh, Islamabad because they just didn't welcome uh, refugees. Uh, when I came to America at age 13, I had already missed a couple of years of school. And uh, I started in seventh grade. We stayed with my uncle for about maybe a couple months until he found us a house in North Hollywood, mm-hmm. California, mm-hmm. close to San Fernando Valley, where I went to Sun Valley Junior High School. Okay. And my school in Kabul was very small. I spoke the language. I had friends. When I came to the school, I think it had between six to 7,000 students. And I was so lost because my class, I had, in Afghanistan, we had one classroom. The teachers changed. They, after the class was over, we'd have a new teacher coming in. Well, when I came to America, that wasn't the case. We had six different classes that I had to find on this humongous property. And I tell you, that was nerve wracking. Yeah. By myself, not knowing the language, not knowing how to ask for help. And I was crying as I was looking for classrooms. I was just, I had to literally do everything for myself. And I, in in retrospective, I'm so glad because from that earlier on in my life, I had to go inward and find the strength within my weaknesses and my most fearful experiences and years of my life. So, but I did it, you know? Yeah. I did it. And that, to, to put it, not too fine a point on it, that is uh, about one of the hardest things that you can do in a whole new culture. Uh, again, I, not knowing the language. And and when you and I spoke um, a number of days ago, you talked about how 
so you're scared. You don't know the language. You are trying to figure out something that is so much more complex than where you came from. And also, I tell me if I'm wrong here. Were, were you bullied because you didn't speak English? I sure was. Uh, you know, the human spirit is so fragile. I call this emotional intelligence. We naturally kind of show our emotions when we're scared, when we're excited, when we're mad. And it's a nonverbal communication, Kevin. You right. know, it's all about frequencies. So I might have looked very, very vulnerable to the public, to the other students, particularly to the bullies. Let's face it. They don't go after strong kids. They go after the ones that are easier to get to. Right. And so, yes, I got bullied by the boys calling me basura. I got bullied by um, the girls. But, well, well uh, what does basura mean? Basura in Spanish means trash can. And my name, Masuda, kind of rhymes with it. So the boys in my classes, in my English as second language classes, used to always call me Basuda, like a group of them. Then they would laugh at me or pull my hair. Just the same typical things, but a little bit worse because they knew that I was vulnerable. Oh, that's terrible. And also, I think you had told me, too, that... The society, or excuse me, the um, the culture and society that you came from, uh, the females were. Tell us about how it was different. How you act, uh, were taught to act growing up, and then you come to the U.S. and you're still trying to kind of fit in that mold and and kind of the reactions that 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 engendered from people. Well, Kevin, I don't want to put down my culture and my country because there are a lot of things that I absolutely adore and I have held on to and I practice on a daily basis. But there are a lot of things that uh, I don't agree with. And gender crisis has been a historical dilemma in my country for hundreds, if not thousands of years, where, I mean, even in other parts of the uh, world, but let's not go there. Just I'm focusing on my country where girls are supposed to be quiet. Mm. Because if you're quiet, you're considered to be polite. You're considered that you have manners. You're not supposed to be feeling or showing your um, emotions. Uh, usually the man sat around the table, sometimes like other parts of the world, uh, and they had their discussions. The gender is pretty much very, very isolated, segregated, if you will, even to this day in America. When I go to parties, they've got the men's room and the women's room, and it really appalls me to the core. So at, as a 13-year-old, I was a product of my environment from my country where I had to be very submissive in order to, you know, just, just the way they raise the boys and girls differently. Boys can go and tear the whole world apart, and they're cool and studs and stellars. But girls, if you smile at, 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 at a male, you're already labeled as someone not so good. So I don't want to, that's another book. But so when I came to America, just to give you a little uh, background, I was very much that person. I was that person. And here I am in a world that's completely the opposite of the way I had been raised, where you had to be a go-getter, stand for yourself, be outspoken, just to just to um, survive, if you will. Right. And w what was it? So what did you, you said that you kind of became a, a bookworm and you really just started studying a lot. What does that mean that you became a bookworm? You, why, what did you do to turn, turn things around to, to content, to continue to grow uh, in, in America? I got tired of being called dumb, stupid, basura, and I got tired of going into my classes and having so much anxiety where I would like my hands would sweat, my heart would race because I was afraid that the teacher, particularly my math teacher, Mr. Scharf, was going to call on me. And he would always pick on me. And it was humiliating. It's one thing to be humiliated in private, but it's another thing to be humiliated in front of the whole class. How, how would he pick on you? 
and not like in a bad way, just asking me about my homework or if I understood something, you know, he would call on me to, to participate, if you will. Right. But at the time, I, I was such a hot mess that I thought he was just picking on me. <laughs> I was having pity parties, but you know, he was just being a teacher, right? Right. That kind of pain that I was going through was so detrimental to my existence as a human being. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I decided that I was going to change the way I felt. He didn't, no one made me feel anyway, but it was just that I was going through. <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine how difficult that was. I felt very alone, very ashamed that I was 13 and I couldn't speak, couldn't write. So I decided that I was going to change my life around. And I did. My life changed around when I decided to not feel the way I was feeling. And within a year, I became an honor student. Uh, within a year, I became a leader. I joined the leadership group, leadership group called ASF at junior high school, Sun Valley Junior High School. And I was invited to the 1984 Olympics wow. because I was, because they sent a group of uh, honor student as a reward. Uh, we were rewarded for being good students. Not only A's, uh, but also I would every report card I would get uh, cert certificates and awards for excellent. So there was a grade like A, B, C, D, F for mm -hmm. the grade, and mm -hmm. then there was a grade for attendance, and there was a grade for uh, behavior. So the grade for uh, your subjects was le letters, and then for behavior and uh, attendance was E for excellent, and then right think the other letters if you were not so i never missed a class and i was always on time so every time i would get excellent certifications of excellence so they took those students and also i was part of the leadership group where you had to have 4.0 to be part of this group and so they took us to honor us they took us uh to the 1984 olympics and also uh, I was invited to go and watch the taping of Wheels of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune? Television. Yes. I love Wheel of Fortune. Me too. Oh, that, that had to have been fun. It was, but I was so nervous because I th thought I had to uh, participate. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we were in the audience, but that's how innocent I was. <laughs> so I thought they were going to call on me and that I had to solve this puzzle. <laughs> you have to solve the puzzle and you're like, I don't have enough money to buy a vowel. <laughs> Because exactly. I haven't spun the wheel of fortune. Um, but you see, that's how that's how vulnerable I was. That's how innocent I was. Where I just didn't know better. Right. And in going back to what you said about you know you mentioned refugees, and I I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the pa the power of diversity and being a, a refugee, like the difficulty of being a refugee, but why you think they are so important to. Uh, well, in this case, the United States or 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 any culture uh, of which they are are uh, joining. Well, I don't like calling these people refugees, but it is what it is. These are people, just like I always try to put myself in the other person's position, kind of try to understand them instead of being understood. These are normal people. They're I call them political refugees because it is political. That's why they left. And uh, instead of associating these people with stigmas, I think that we are the backbone of societies. We come back, we, we go to these adopted countries, which I'm so thankful of being a, um, having adopted this country as my home. You know, we pay taxes, we go to college, we contribute to the uh, economy of our countries. We bring diversity. We bring richness of music, food, so language. 
And uh, we used to have these uh, celebrations in our schools and everybody would bring some kind of food from their country and dress in their cultural costumes. So it's time that we learn from the experience of these uh, rough political refugees, like from Afghanistan, Ukraine, Syria, and they're so fragile. When they come to their adopted countries, they're already torn. Remember, we have to start from zero, literally. And my situation is not as difficult, was not as difficult as some of these people that come here, like my parents. They're already well into their 30s, 40s, 50s. Okay, they had, even if they were doctors in Afghanistan, well, they can't just come here and become doctors, right? It's different. They have to start all over. They have to go back to school. And our, our lifestyle in Afghanistan was, you know, very good. We, my father had a Mercedes. We, we were, you know, we were very well off. To come to United States and get assistance, which was a blessing, just so you know, was like a reality that I... I was shocked and I was kind of embarrassed about, to be honest with you, Kevin. When you say assistance, do you mean when you first arrived, the government assistance? Yeah, government assistance. Sure. Okay. Yes. But I think, and and you said that you, your dad was able to, he was only on it for a year. uh, And then you guys were able to kind of move in, move off of it. Correct? Yes. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we, uh, that's another reason why uh, we were, admitted to come to United States is because my father is an expert in um, weaving rugs, designing rugs, anything about rugs, silk rugs, uh, new rugs, antique rugs. It's a skill set that not too many people have. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to bring some value to your adopted country. And because he did, that's why we're here. So he is really contributed still does he's got his own business to our economy yeah and you know something that you've said uh, i believe a word that you've used very often in the just this conversation is grateful in referring to the u.s um and tell us about what the united states since you have now lived here for over 40 years what does the united states mean to you kevin words could not would not be able to convey my gratitude for my adopted country. As you know, uh, my country is in turmoil right now. The gender crisis, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is beyond belief. Yeah. And to have been a part of this beautiful nation. And before I say that, I just want to have a message for uh, listeners here, our audience, please. Um, If you haven't lived in any oppressed countries like Afghanistan, uh, Syria, or any other parts of the world in Asia, uh, like North Korea, or uh, any country that uh, there's no freedom of speech, please do not put down our country. And I don't mean to be rude, but I know I'm Afghan American. I'm more American than Afghan. I've lived here most of my life. You don't understand how many people I meet that all they do is bitch, complain, and put our country down. And I don't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a great country. You can come in in America, dress how you want to dress, be who you want to be. You can be religious or not. You can be atheist. You can be Let's face it, it's not a perfect country, but that just doesn't exist. Every country is going to have its pros and cons. So I'm so grateful, Kevin, that I happen to be a woman who lives in the United States of America that has gone through a lot, has put myself through college. I love my freedom. I don't think that I would ever want to live. Like I told you the other day, I'd rather be homeless on the streets of California than to be a queen in one of those uh, countries that treat women uh, worse than dirt. Yeah, I love my country, and I'm so grateful for the men and women that risk their lives on a daily basis so that you and I can have this podcast. Uh, yes, and I think that's all extremely well said, and I th- I think it's such a valuable perspective uh, to share. So thank you for that, for sure. And it it, it is telling that 
uh, you also said to me the other day, without freedom, you would not want to live. Um, and, and, and that is also shown through what you said about rather be, you would rather be homeless on the streets of California than say a princess in one of these very wealthy yet oppressive countries, um, which, you know, is, is saying a lot to, to your ethos and your love of this country and your, and your love of freedom and your love of, of life. And I, I just think that's really powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Kevin, for asking that important question. Um, well, I want to talk about, and tell me if I get this wrong, the 2005 Mrs. World Beauty pageant. Is that, did I say it right? You absolutely did, Kevin. Yes, yes. <laughs> Write that down. Uh, <laughs> yay. All right. So what is the Mrs. World Beauty pageant? So um, in 2001, when we had the unfortunate devastation of September 11, I was just torn because uh, part of me is American, part of me is Afghan, and mm -hmm. I will all be always be an Afghan. So um, as you know, most people thought that the terrorists were Afghans. Right. And I was even my own little town, sleepy town of Carmel by the sea, just, I don't want to go into complaining because I just don't believe in complaining, but there were issues. There were issues, and I was being um, kind of, uh, um, what do you call it? There's Har a word for harassed? it. Harassed? Um. Not so much harassed, but, you know, sarcasm and just people saying things about Afghanistan and certain uh, hatred, uh, but... It was all because of ignorance. All, most all of the people that attacked us on September 11 were Arabs. So not to put them down or anything, but let's face it, facts are facts. So that's when I started to really get involved with what was happening in my beloved country in Afghanistan. And the women were just getting really, really uh, uh, treated poorly by the Taliban, even then, before all these countries went to Afghanistan, United, including United States. So I wrote a letter. Uh, I, I literally, every day on the news, I could see bombs going off, uh, attacks, civilians getting killed, uh, you know, schools being closed, women being killed because they didn't have their hijab on the right way. And I could not believe that that was my Afghanistan that I lived in. Uh, under the rule of Shah Zahir Shah or King, which were, they called it, you know, a little America, women wearing mini skirts, going to university, so forth. I, I was devastated to see any human being, any, any human being, that's any human being being treated that way for any reason. So I decided to do something positive with my um, aching heart. And I wrote a letter to Mrs. World, and I, what I just told you, I explained to them in my letter. And I didn't really expect to hear back because I don't believe in expectations. Mm -hmm. I have zero expectations in my life from the outside world. So to my surprise, not only that I heard back from Mrs. World, I heard back from the CEO and original founder, Mr. David Mar Marmel. Wow. Wow. So you, as you said, you had no expectations. Uh, well, I've done this. And then you hear from the head of the whole uh, enterprise. What did he say to you? Wow. I was like, uh, he was just in awe of my courage in that letter. And he welcomed me. He said, I would love for you to be a part of this prestigious international beauty pageant. My reason for that platform was to raise awareness to what was happening to our human sisters and mothers in my uh, motherland. I wanted to bring international global attention to the mistreatments of girls and banning of education and women being killed for wearing makeup for wearing. I mean, just if I named it, you would probably laugh. But anyway, thanks to him. I had zero experience. Most of those women had been, you know, training since they were five years old as beauty little girls. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I was totally green, he just uh, honored me. And by the way, he congratulated me. He called me. He said, Con by the way, congratulations. We've never had a delegate from Afghanistan. You were the first one. Wow. That had to be <laughs> a really cool thing to learn. Did you know that before you uh, submitted? I did not. Yeah. Okay. I was just venting. I was venting. 
when I'm hurting, just so you know, I become this positive thing. So when I am hurting, when I am pain, like I am right now, that's why I'm doing something positive with my pain and uh, discomfort. I write. So I wrote that letter and that's how I was able to uh, represent Afghan women and girls at that pageant on a global um, level. Can I, can I ask you something? Um, when you find, cause I do the same thing when I'm really upset, I often write. And do you find that you're writing about one thing and then maybe a paragraph in or a couple sentences or whatever it may be, you're writing about something that you weren't expecting to write about. Do you ever have that experience? Yes. All the time. Isn't it yes. a wonderful experience? I love it. It's like, it's like learning to me when yeah. you learn something and then you find you just, I can sit there for hours and just keep learning because it's addictive. So, and you, uh, you and I have that in common. Um, so you uh, are, are brought on, you're going to represent Afghanistan in this world beauty pageant. Um, and where was the pageant? So before I answer that question, I just want to share something that's positive. You know, my story is a little bit heavy, but there are also a lot of fun, exciting, romantic things about it. When I was in Afghanistan as a little girl, uh, I loved Bollywood. Uh, most Afghans love Bollywood, uh, watching movies, music, food, spices. We were very much inspired by our neighbors. So my dream was to one day go to India, just to go to India because of my um, celebrity crushes and just my fascination with Bollywood. Well, do you know that my humanitarian work, trying to be an advocate, a voice for the voiceless, I had no idea where Mrs. World was going to be held. I just wrote a letter because of my cause, my platform. I was like in shock when Mr. David Marmel told me, by the way, this year we have an, an incredible destination because Mrs. World is going to be held, hosted in a, a brand new resort in Bombay, India. Wow. When he told me that, my heart nearly stopped. Did it just jump out of your chest? You're just like, yes. I couldn't believe it. And yeah. he said, by the way, by the way, you're going to be surrounded by Bollywood celebrities. Because, you know, this is a brand new resort. And uh, the wealthy in India is, I cannot even measure their wealth. Very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, be ready to get treated like royalty because it's going to be an experience that you will always cherish in your life. And he was very liberal about that statement. It was that and plus more. So that's, uh, that's amazing, especially for a little girl growing up one of six watching these Bollywood films dreaming. And then now you were doing something positive or trying to, and you get to go to India. Um, I want to end uh, not, I, I want to, to, to stay on the positive note. I want to bring up something that's very troubling that happened to you before we end on a really positive note. Okay. Um, how long after you kind of announced, it was announced that you were going to be a part of uh, this and representing Afghanistan. Did you start getting death threats? Well, the whole reason why I wanted to do this wasn't to be a beauty queen or anything. It was, as you know, is to, to raise a global awareness. And I was very much uh, vocal about it. I gave interviews and um, I've been in uh, newspapers. And of course, I'm a real estate agent and we're just open books. Our information is very public. So because of my interviews, uh, my husband and I, who's American, Mexican-American, we were getting death threats from all over the world uh, telling me, how dare you represent Afghanistan? You're not Afghan. You, you are an American, blah, blah, blah. Well, they found me. The Taliban found me. And uh, my husband was my um, bodyguard. One day I was selling a beautiful home on the golf course in Carmel. And I look up and there was the devil himself. I, okay. They so they so you're getting. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're. I just want to make sure I understand. You're getting death threats, horrifying death threats for doing something as simple as well. It's not simple. It should be, 
but uh, as being in a pageant to represent the strength uh, uh, of of uh, women. And you're saying that you're doing an open house and then you came in and there there was somebody there to kill you? So um, I was there early, just getting okay. prepared, getting my flyers ready. My husband uh, luckily was with me because he was with me because of these death threats. So he went to put my open house sign on the golf course, hoping that some golfers would come and buy this house. As he was doing that, somebody started talking to me and the uh, open house wasn't even, hadn't even started yet. He came in, he had long black beard and eye makeup and very filthy and with a thick accent. Uh, I think he was from Pakistan and he, um, I don't even now remember what he said, but he said something to me and I screamed. And all I remember what I told him was that, how did you hear about this open house? And I thought to myself, this is it. I am going to die right now. Luckily, Kevin, I was standing behind my desk where I was getting set up was behind open French doors. Luckily, I was in a part of the house that allowed me to skate. If I had been in the kitchen or in the bathroom or upstairs, I would have been dead. And so I I started screaming and I had two legs and I borrowed two more and I ran <laughs> as fast as I could. Okay. And so you <laughs> borrowed two <laughs> you more. Like that Afghani I, expression? <laughs> is that an Afghani expression? Yes. Oh, I that's a great legs, expression. I borrowed two more and I was out of there at the speed of light, baby. Uh, okay. So you got out of there and thankfully, as you said, your husband was there. So did you go find your husband? Did you come back in? What happened next? So I went running to my husband and we came back. I told him exactly what happened. He couldn't believe it. He was like, no way. I said, yes, it just happened. So we go outside, no one there. We go in the house looking, it was a big house, no one. So he must have had someone waiting for him. But the, here's a very important point that I'm going to make before we end this um, interview is that God will always protect us. I believe that our birth date and departure date are already determined. And I did not allow fear to stop me from what I was going to do. And I was told not to go by my family after that experience, that traumatic experience. No way. But I said, no, nope, my life is not worthy if I don't go. I said, mm -hmm. women and girls are getting killed. Excuse me, for apparent no reason. So I was willing to die. I was willing to die for my human family, my Afghan sisters and mothers in Afghanistan that were getting killed for no reason at the soccer stadium with my uncles used to play soccer. So I'm so glad that I let faith take over my life, God the Almighty, and not fear. And today I'm so grateful that I can reminisce about my experiences at Mrs. Afghanistan and go globally, raise awareness and share my story because it's uh, very profound. Yeah, it. I think profound is an understatement. I, 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 I think that your story and I know that we there's so much that that we did not get to. But, you know, what you did and what you were standing up for uh, is you're a pillar of strength to me and you're somebody who really does inspire me and to say like, no, I'm going to do this because this is the right thing to do and to not live by fear and to have come through everything that you have come through, whether it be the two years of trying to get to a new country where you did not even speak the language, where you then picked yourself up and said, I'm going to learn because uh, I'm tired, as you had said, of being the victim all the way through when you uh, were able to do this pageant. And tell us real fast about how about uh, the Afghan and American flags together when you were in the pageant. Oh, my gosh, Kevin. Do you know that I was just thinking about saying that before we said goodbye? Because it's very powerful. Uh, so for the first time. In my life, I was so close to my beloved birthplace. I cried myself every night. And I'm not joking. Every night I cried because I can smell the fragrance of my country. I felt so close, but it's so far. And the fruit, the food, the are beautiful aromas of the food and everything. But it was what it was. And one powerful thing that I experienced is about um, my freedom. 
Uh, I'm a runner. I race and all that. So one morning I'd gone early in the morning running. When I came back, they had put all the flags of different uh, delegates in their countries on the outside of the building where the pageant was going to be uh, taking place. And for the first time, I saw my country in a positive light. I looked up because Afghanistan and America both started with the letter A. The very first flag was the flag of Afghanistan. And the second flag was my flag, my adopted countries. And to me, those are very symbolic that it was my American country, my American dream, my adopted beautiful country that gave me the freedom to go and do what I did for my birth country in India and to represent it in such a positive light. I fell to my knees, literally, Kevin. I um, had tears of uh, joy. I had tears of happiness. I had tears of sadness because those 10 days were very emotional, as I told you, because I was so close to Afghanistan for the first time since I was 11 when I escaped. And I just looked up and God thanked me. I'm very close to my faith, God the Almighty. God thanked me for taking this risk to be there that there, there were our flags and that that was the end, that I was, oh, I overcame the uh, challenges of going to India and all the risks that involved, but it was so worth it because I did it. And you thanks to America for giving me the freedom to do that. And thanks to my country uh, that I had the the honor of having born there and having lived there the first 11 important years of my life. Masuda, I can't thank you enough for coming on and for telling this story, this extremely important, harrowing, brave story. I admire you. I admire what you have done. I admire the message. You are working on a book and um, tell us the name of that, what the name of that book will be. The book is finished already, Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry. You finished it. My bad. What is the name of the book? Uh, the name of my book is called Almost Killed by the Taliban. The Taliban, of course, is in power now again. So this is yet another brave thing that you are doing in order to get your story out there. Right now, I'm just because Afghanistan has been forgotten. I don't want to get too political because I don't like politics, but it is what it is. Uh, Afghanistan is alone right now. The people of Afghanistan are paying the price of our governments, all the things that went on that I will not get into. Uh, particularly, I'm getting back into media, back on these international um, uh, platforms. Like I have another one in Canada, another interview in Canada. It's just uh, because I want to raise awareness to the international community. Where is our sense of awareness? There are women and girls are getting killed right now. Girls are not allowed to go to school past sixth grade. Like, we need to do something. We need to renegotiate with the Taliban because this is our humanitarian crisis that is happening in silence. And pretty much we told the Taliban, it's none of our business. Take care of your country. We're out of here. And it was the most horrific way to exit that country. And they took the, uh, over Afghanistan within days, within days. I could not believe it. So uh, my book is great because it's a memoir. I'm telling a story, which is inspirational. But the reason why I'm on your show and I'm going to be on shows around the world is that we need to stand up and be the voice for the voiceless. Even if I have to lose my life again, I will do it. But this is my platform. And we will have your website in uh, the show notes as well so that people can learn more about what you're doing, some of the other interviews that you have done. Masuda, thank you so, so, so much for coming on today, for telling your story and, and for just inspiring, I'm sure, every person that has listened to this. I really, really appreciate it. Kevin, it's a great honor. And I'm really, really grateful for you. And the stories that you and I shared with each other on the phone the other day, thank you for being strong. And I'm so proud of you for uh, starting this platform so that we can come together as a global community and share our stories. Because let's face it, stories change the world. Thank you. Couldn't agree more, my friend. And um, for thank you again. And for everybody else who's out there, I will end the same way I always try to, to remind you that there is always room for kindness and grace. 
even with ourselves, most importantly, perhaps with ourselves. There's always room for kindness and grace, and we will see you next time on Sad Times. You've been listening to a fourth-hand joint.